Hi all, we are starting a new series on whether an opening suits you as a player. And yes, we'll be talking about our personal taste, preference and philosophies as chess players. Because I think, truly believe that, that openings are the area that you can truly re reflect your persona as a chess player. Today, we are talking about the Karokan defense. The question is, is the Karokan good for you? Here's the first puzzle. Imagine that white just calls h3. What should black do in this position? I'm, test I'm actually testing right now your Karokan instincts. If you're truly a Karokan player in the right spirit, you should find black's next move relatively fast. That should come natural to you. You should have a natural affinity to black's next move. Okay, this series, we'll be talking about openings, how it connects to the middle game and the end game. I'll be showing you typical breaks, typical exchanges, typical pawn structures, and typical pawn breaks and plans in the Karokan defense. And while I'm doing that, I want you to be aware of your own preferences. You should ask yourself whether you could also find those plans and ideas in your own games, whether they come natural to you as a player, and whether you would like to try Karokan in your games. In other words, whether Karakan defense is good for you, because this is a beautiful part of chess openings. It's like a personal dress. You're just choosing an opening that suits you as a person. You can reflect your persona. Okay, let's continue with this position. In this position, white wants to go g4 to chase away your beautiful knight on f5. So black should go h4, freezing this pawn, stopping g4, and cementing your knight on f5. That's a beautiful move. Karokan players love to play end games in general, especially end game like this, where white pieces are paralyzed in defending that weakness on d4. And yes, Karokan defense very much connects to the end game, long term weaknesses, gradual improvement in the end game, long grinds in the end game, and winning because of superior piece activity and better structure in general. So, this is the true spirit of playing the Karokan. This will be a dream Karokan ending, right? I hope this came natural to you, this move H4. And this is some sort of an ideal, let's say, end game that you're seeking for when you're playing the Karokan in the French pawn structure because they are sister systems. French and Karokan, they resemble each other, but Karokan players want to improve on a typical French defense. What do, you, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is this, right? E4, C6, Karokan, D4, D5, after they go e5, can you believe that on chess.com, below 1000 chess.com, 20% of people, they go e6 in this position. Oh my god, they are killing their own bishop by going e6. That's incredible. Of course, we don't want that as Karokan players. We want to get the bishop outside of the pawn chain first and then want to go e6, right? Setting the basic things first. Is there absolutely Karokan 101, folks? Yeah, that's a French pawn structure after e6 and black wants to improve on the French defense, okay? And um, I will now show you a typical and beautiful game in Chess Classic. And obviously, Capablanca is the guy that you should follow with Karokan. Capablanca, Karpov, Simislov, and Botvinnik, they are the world champions that actually love the Karokan defense. I will put model games in the description below. In this case, we are actually analyzing the exchange Karokan. And already we have a Carlsbad pawn structure on the board, right? Carlsbad pawn structure, white is a C pawn versus black's E pawn. That's a major imbalance in the pawn structure. And Carlsbad pawn structure brings its own unique elements in the middle game, right? So that's how you should also study this structure. And uh, bishop g4, well, Capablanca wants to very naturally get the bishop outside the chain first before playing e6, very logical. And white wants to stop that by attacking the pawn on b7. White wants to stop Black's ideal setup. So now we are actually coming to the critical moment, folks. Please bear with me. My question is, after e6 and castles, can you stop the video and find a good plan for Black? And now we are talking about the middle game plans, right? Please, what is the most logical, strategic plan for Black in this position? Congratulations if you found bishop b5, exchanging off your bad bishop for the opponent's good bishop in a spawn structure. Typical Karokan slash French exchange operation. And again, you should study openings like this. No memorization, but knowing the typical middle game plans. That's how you become a universally good chess player. This connects. You want to connect the opening middle game and the end game. I made a video about this. I will also put it on the description below, folks. Okay? 
I told you, French and Karokan, they are brothers and sisters. I'm going to show you a French defense position with a similar idea. Beliavsky, what do you think Black's next move was in this game, folks? Tell me. Bishop b5, just like in the Capablanca example, right? He wants to exchange off his bad, terrible French bishop for white's good bishop. And Black actually gains equality as a result of this. Even Queen a6, a typical Karokan slash French exchange because the endgames are better for Black. Why? Because this pawn is overextended. The e5 pawn actually helps white in the middle game because it improves attacking chances, right? There's no knight, knight f6, for example. White can attack the king side in the middle game. But if the game goes to pure ending, then Karokan players starting to be happy, right? That's what you start to grind down those endgames. So again, these are very important information for you. You know, typical plans if you choose to play the Karo. Talking about the Karlsbad pawn structure, right? We have a Karlsbad pawn structure on the board. White is the extra C pawn. Black is the extra E pawn. Very common thing in the exchange Karokan. Can you stop the video right now and tell me what's the best plan for Black in this position? Black is a very natural plan, very powerful plan. It is a universal plan in chess, actually. Congratulations if you found the minority attack and Black goes B5. Black's plan is very simple. Eventually to go A5, B4 and create a weakness on the queen side, right? This is the spirit and goal of the minority attack in chess. Why minority? Because black only has two pawns versus three, right? So black is actually starting a minority attack on the queen side. Why? Because right now, white has no clear target, clear weakness that we can attack. But once you go B5, A5, B4, you want to create, you will create inevitably a weakness on the queen side. And as Karokan players, you want to have a long-term grind on those long-term targets later on. White usually has chances in the card spot on the king side, but here white's pieces are not ideally placed. Usually there should be a knight on e5 and so on. And also white is in no position to actually get the pieces to the h file to mate us, right? So white is no real attack on the king side, but black's attack on the queen side is just starting. Check this out, a4, very nice. Black's idea is very simple. I want to go a3 and I want to destroy your pawn chain, right? Karokan. Positional chess. You need to. You should be strategic in mind. Positional in mind. That's actually exactly what favors Karakam players. Knight B1 is very passive, but White in this position, if they go H5 instead of Knight Knight B1, this was the point of Black. Right? We are breaking the pawn chain, and this actually is just a beautiful position for Black. Everything will be destroyed on the Queen side, and Black achieves a winning position. There is no attack on the King side for White. Okay, and in the actual game, he goes Knight B1, but Black says, you know what? Thank you so much for giving me this extra e4 square for my knight black basically just slowly grinds down the queen side every single piece is directed on the queen side minority attack is achieved in a beautiful fashion for black knight e4 we should be six exchange and you see inevitably there will be a weakness on the queen side black takes his time now he actually forces white to take on b4 but now this gave us right beautiful weaknesses on the queen side and that's a long-term grind and black actually even forcefully takes one of these pawns White loses one pawn, white loses the second pawn, and white resigns after queen b6. This was a grandmaster game, beautiful game, um, but this actually exactly shows us the plans, right, in the middle of the game. So you should always keep those plans in mind, by the way. When you learn an opening, instead of memorizing, as I said, you should follow and study the typical plans in the middle game. And minority attack is one such typical plan in the cross but Keep that in mind, folks. I hope this came natural to you. I will show you a game of Gary Kastorov. Even Gary played the Karo Khan, right? Because we associate Gary with neither of crazy Sicilians and so on, attacking Jets. But Gary, when he was younger, he was only 14 at this game, he was playing Karo Khan defense regularly until his coach told him that, you know what, you're a much more fighter, you're like an aggressive player, switch to Neidorf. And then he switched to Neidorf with great success, of course. So this is a typical mainline Karo Khan. In fact, when you talk about the Karo Khan pawn structure, you're talking about this, e6 and c6 pawns versus d4 for white, right? Black actually, now I'm going to talk, talk about pawn breaks in middle game. Here we arrive at a critical moment, rook h4. White goal is very simple. Long castle, g4, g5, and crash house on the king side. That's a very ambitious plan. And usually, maybe you tell me, if I ask you, for example, what are the typical breaks for black in this structure? Tell me, the very typical breaks. Yes. Karokan players, congratulations if you came up at c5. That's the most stock standard break to equalize for black because you want to challenge that central pawn. You want to activate your pieces. 
and e c5 achieves that much easily usually than e5 right because e5 is controlled by several pieces for it but in this game <laughs> gary finds an even more even stronger break in his position can you guess it please stop the video and find this break for black typical gary bam he goes b5 well there's a king in the center and black wants to use that d5 square undermine that d5 square for his pieces black also anticipates white's promising long-term plan g4 g5 and black strikes in the center as well it's a beautiful move if he takes that pawn twice by the way right if he takes that twice then rook eight is coming and typical gary he will get the pawn back with great peace activity if in this position white goes after b5 if, if in this position white goes c5 queen d5 was the point now knight h knight h5 is are coming this queen is actually using this beautiful central square and black already achieves a small advantage in this position so you see after b5 white is no great way if he does b3 by the way then gary will take and then he goes rook b8 and again we are messing up with white's plan right we're activating our pieces you see how pawn play connects with peace activity in chess so we should also really really study typical pawn breaks in our openings and that's exactly what, how Gary won this game, queen d5. As I said, Karokan players are usually welcoming endgames. And look at this. Gary is forcing a queen trade because he's trusting his chances in the endgame. Just to show you briefly how Gary won this game, right? It's sort of untypical Gary Kasparov, yeah? Because uh, he was a much more dynamical attacking player. But he knows his openings for sure. Slowly, he grinds down his pieces, activates them all. Rooks are much more active. Knight e6 is a very nice move, by the way. Defending f7, hitting the rook. And then comes rook b8, the final piece joins the action. And look at the black pieces. Those knights and the rook is invading the first rank. And white has weaknesses, right? These are weak. And that's exactly how Gary Kasparov won this game. Very, very quickly, I'm just going to show you how the game ended. It's just a beautiful Karakan grind, by the way, folks. If you like what you're seeing, white resigned this position, then, um, then I think you should also, you know, try the Karakan defense. But never forget those typical breaks in the middle game now one more great world champion anatoly karpov also took the karo Khan defense regularly and it can go dynamical as well in the karo especially the panel botvinnik attack right he's playing as vishwanathan anand with the white pieces and anand goes for the most dynamical panel botvinnik attack just to show you again right this is white's let's say most dynamical option against the karo Khan usually yeah? because white accepts and eyes related queen's pawn in the opening yeah in the middle of the game because that will give him additional chances to attack the king's side right now we have an iqp on d4 white will have good piece activity e5 square and so on and white will try his chances in the middle game but if you're a karokan player and end games are usually favoring you right karpov was a great defender so he actually took these positions he likes to play against the iqp and it shows us different ways of defending those positions. So if you actually also are good at defense, if you can fend off opponent's attacks, if you see yourself as a prophylactic player, then Karokan is also a good opening for you. I will show you exactly how this formation came about. And that's interesting because the pawn formation changes, right? It's no longer an IQP, but this pawn structure, if white goes C4, it might be even a hanging pawn structure. You see, it's a very rich opening as well in terms of pawn structures. We can see and face several different pawn structures in the Karokan defense. So knight d6 is very nice because Karpo is initiating peace trade. Why? Because his king might be in trouble in the middle game, but in the end game, right? You're talking about these things. So he's securing his end game chances by these peace trades, exchanges. And now he says his king is very safe. And the future is bright for black in the Karakan defense. If Anand took on e5 with the queen, queen d5 was Karpov's idea, right? Forcing a queen trade because of this. And now this is a completely equal endgame, actually. But maybe, you know, black can actually, uh, let's say, go here, or maybe bishop e6, followed by rook c8, hit and target those weaknesses. Maybe black can, you know, play for a winning position. Not a big edge, of course, it's, it's equal, actually. But Anand didn't go for this. Anand wants to keep more, let's say, pieces on the board. But now comes the Karpovian defensive technique. Anand should have taken f6. He didn't do it. And now we see Karpovian grind in the endgame. Now there's a pin on the D file. You can start the video and find how Karpov solved his pin problem. Bam. Short calculation, folks. Counterattack on the queen. You cannot take my queen because I take on d1. And Karpov 
solved his pin problem. And now Carpo is putting his pieces on light squares, hitting those targets and even hitting those targets. And from here, Carpovian grind starts. Rook c4. Why? Because end games are good for us and middle games are not so much because of white's good pieces. So Carpo exchanges off a pair of rooks. Now white has no attacking chances and those weaknesses are going to be there for a long, long time. Right? Again, if you ask the engine, it says a very little edge for black right now, but it's unpleasant to play for white. And if you're a player that likes such long-term grinds in the endgame, then Karokan is a great opening for you. Please give it a shot. Again, another exchange, because this is creating an outside pass form for black, and black actually still is slightly better. And of course, Anand defends very nicely, but here Karpovian grind begins. A5 is very nice because he basically push, pushes the pawn on the queen side, the outside pass pawn. C6 is maybe not great, but he's going to lose the pawn anyways, right? So this pawn is hanging. So Anand decides to give this pawn instead to maybe defend this one on h5. But Karpovian endgame grind begins here, folks. Please study this game carefully. I will put all these games in the description, by the way, so you can actually enjoy them to its full, fullest. And now comes the beautiful phase, improving the bishop first, a2 h5 very important and here after h4 Anand resigned because no matter what white does white cannot deal with both of these pawns later stage of this game so this is a beautiful beautiful end game folks Karokan is not always a dry opening folks it can also go very dynamical where lots of calculation exists check this variation which became very popular recently right takes takes not f6 this not f6 line in the Karo takes and take with the e pawn Black relies on dynamical chances in the middle game. Why? Because the black king will be much more secure in this middle game because of the extra pawn that is covering the black king. But if the game goes to a pure pawn end game, then white is winning. If you don't trust me, remove all the pieces from the board and play that pawn end game. So this will shape the entire strategy for black in the Karo. Suddenly it's a black pieces with the Karo Khan defense who is going for an attack on the king's side and dynamism on the king's side typical alpha zero pawn push on the h file forces h3 literally and now you're gonna see a typical idea for black in this position can you guess for example please stop the video and formulate a middle game plan for black in this position it's a game between Bocatura and david howell yes bishop c7 followed by queen d6 and we're gonna attack the white king on those dark squares because we trust in our chances in the middle game and knight f4. Very, very quickly, I'm going to show you this, this game, folks. Just bear with me. Knight e6, of course, he wants to exchange off that knight. Who is stopping my queen from invading your position. Knight exchange. Still, if you look at the pure pawn structure issues, the pawn end game is winning for white. But the god save created the middle game before the end game, as Tarash has said, and enters the position with queen h2. The white king must be very careful in this middle game. White can hold himself the best play, but there's also a very high chance that they go wrong in actual game. Rook h4, and here comes the key question, folks. Can you stop the video and find the next move for black? I want you to calculate a deep line, perhaps. It might be maybe too difficult, but imagine that you're playing this position with black pieces. Can you guess what David Howell did in this position? Bam! Rook takes e3. It's a beautiful calculation from black box. Check this out. If you take with the king, I take your rook. That's the game continuation. And if you take with the f pawn, I take on g2 first. Then, then I take on c2. Right? Followed by, you guessed it right, bishop g3. Look at the depth of this calculation, folks. It can go very dynamical, this variation in the Karokan as well. So he took on e3, took back with the king. At first sight, at first sight, it looks like white is still crashing because white is all the threats on the board, despite black being a piece up. But David Hubble's calculation continues. Bishop d6, amazing move. And the idea is that, yes, you will lose the rook on a8, but the king on f3 is not safe at all. And calculation keeps going. That's just a beautiful, beautiful game. Very dynamical attacking game. And white resigned after queen takes b2 because this is hanging and white no longer has any check in this position. The bottom line is this. Karokan defense can also switch those dynamical players if you choose the right variation. So you can mix it up, right? You can usually play it solid and safe and nice grind in the end games.
But if you, let's say, need full points, or let's say you want to sharpen up the position, then you can also try this Tartar cover defense with the black piece uh, to conclude this video, folks. I hope you have a better feeling about the Karo Khan. I hope you ask yourself those questions, whether Karo Khan is an opening that suits your style as a player in chess. Check these world champions, Capablanca, Bot Phoenix, Smithlow, Carpo. They were great Karo Khan players, and I would like you to look at their games, model games in the Karo. This will definitely improve your chess understanding, opening understanding, right? Again, if you're a technical player, if you're loving the end games, then Karokan might be a good choice for you. Strategic opening for sure, right? It's a very solid choice as well for Black. You don't need to memorize so many moves as well, just like in Crazy Grunfeld or Nidorf, right? It's a structure-based opening, mostly, I would say. It's Of course, there are lots of pawn structures that you can get in your games, but if you deeply understand those structures, then you can actually have great chances to slowly grind the openings without so, too much chaos on the board, right? This can switch so many players, including me. I was a player like that as a chess player. I was much more strategic in mind. I love the end games and so on, right? Ask yourself these questions. Obviously, it can also get very dynamical, right? In the Pano Botvinnik, in Tartakovar, Karo, for example, they can get very dynamic as well, depending on the structure. Just to sum up what we've seen in this video, these are the diverse pawn structures you can get in the Karakan defense with unique middle game plans as described. If you liked what you saw in this video, please give me a like and subscribe and we can reach more people and we can convert them to the Karakan defense perhaps. If you also love the Karakan defense like I do, folks, please send me your feedback and comments. I hope you found it useful. Send me your ideas about what should be in my next opening analysis in this series. Thank you so much.